Hey there, this is MathCamp321 presenting a lesson on the Intermediate Value Theorem. I'd like you to take notes on this brief lesson as I go through it and copy down and really reflect on some of the things that we are bringing up here. Before I actually write down the Intermediate Value Theorem, I'm going to show you what it is by way of an illustration. Let's consider a function f of x on a closed interval a, b. Now, if the point to the left is a, and we plug it into the function f of x, then the height of that point will be known as f of a. Now, if we jump to the right-hand side of the interval b, and we plug b into the function f of x, then the height of that point will be f of b. Now, in order for the intermediate value theorem to work, the function that you're working with has to be continuous on this closed interval from a to b. That means there can't be any breaks holes or asymptotes or anything like that. So this is just a nice smooth curve without any of those things. So this function appears to be continuous. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to select a value called k that lies somewhere arbitrarily between f of a and f of b. So I'm going to pick a k value down here and I'm going to notate that with the cursive letter k. Now what the intermediate value theorem tells me is that if the function is continuous on this closed interval from a to b, then there exists some value c in between a and b for which f of c equals k. So if I project this value k over to the curve and then I project straight down, this is that value c. This is the value c between a and b for which f of c equals k. And the intermediate value theorem is going to guarantee that if all the conditions are met, there will be at least one c. Now in green, I've illustrated for you that there is one such c. But if I were to take a different value for k, let's use a different color, maybe orange, and if I move it up just a little bit higher, but still between f of a and f of b, Let's take a look at what happens. I'll call this k sub 2. Now, if I project the line straight over, it's going to hit the curve three times. Now, if I project straight down, I'll have a c there, I'll have a second c there, and I'll have a third c there. So the intermediate value theorem is going to say, if all of the conditions are met, then I will have at least one c for which f of c will equal k. Okay, now let's write the theorem out in words, and maybe it'll make a little bit more sense because I've already shown you the illustration. So the intermediate value theorem, or the IVT. Suppose a function f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, and there exists a number k such that k is between f of a and f of b. Then, there is at least one number c on the closed interval from a to b for which f of c equals k. Now I'm going to walk you through a few examples which will further help you to understand this theorem. In this question, they're asking which of the following sketches would be inconclusive by the Intermediate Value Theorem, or IVT. To answer this question, we have to look at each sketch and address the two conditions of the theorem. The first condition is, is the function continuous? So if we look at graph A, we're given a piecewise function over an interval from A to B. And it's clear that this is not a continuous function. Because it's not continuous on that interval, the IVT does not apply. In graph B, the function f appears to be continuous on a, b. There are no asymptotes, holes, or gaps. So the next thing that we have to look at, because condition one has been met, is whether the k value that they give to us is in between f of a and f of b. If we look at the k in red, it is not in between f of a and f of b. Therefore, the IVT again does not apply. If we look at graph c, we'll first address the continuity. This graph appears to be continuous on the closed interval from A to B. There are no gaps, holes, or asymptotes. 
Now, let's consider where the K is in relation to A and B. Well, this time the K value is also not in between F of A or F of B. So, once again, the function is continuous, but K is not in between F of A and F of B. Okay, looking at graph D, let's establish whether this function is continuous on the closed interval from A to B. And as I look at it, it appears to be continuous. There's no holes, gaps, or asymptotes. Now, A is sent to F of A, B is sent to F of B, and the K value that we're working with, that they give to us, is in between F of A and F of B. Therefore, the IVT will apply. And what that means is there is going to be at least one value C, which is between A and B, for which F of C will equal K. And that C value will be right here. F of C will equal K. In this question, they're asking us to find the number of solutions for C for which f of c will equal k. So the first thing that I want to point out in these three sketches is that each of the graphs is continuous on the closed interval from a to b. The second thing that I'd like to point out is that in each of the cases, k is between f of a and f of b. So what they're asking us for is how many solutions for c will there be such that f of c equals k? If we look at A, the line, the red line, hits the graph three times. Here, here, and here. So the answer would be three. In graph B, the red line only hits the graph one time. And in graph C, the red line hits the curve or the function two times. So the point of this exercise was to show you that there could be one two or even many values of c for which f of c equals k. Now of course if the function isn't continuous on a b or if k is not in between f of a or f of b then the intermediate value theorem won't work at all and no guarantees will be made. Number three asks does f of x equaling 2x cubed plus x squared minus 8x minus 4 have a root on the interval negative 1 to 1. This is a classic intermediate value theorem question. Well, from pre-calculus you should know that this particular type of function is a polynomial function and there are no locations for x that are going to be discontinuous. There are no holes, breaks, or asymptotes. So the first condition of the intermediate value theorem is met and that is f of x is continuous on this closed interval negative 1 to 1. Now the next thing I need to figure out is what is f of negative 1 and what is f of 1? How high do these endpoints go? So let's do that calculation right now starting with f of negative 1. f of negative 1 is going to be 2 times negative 1 cubed plus negative 1 squared minus 8 times negative 1 minus 4. This is going to leave me with negative 2 plus 1 plus 8 minus 4. This leaves me with negative 1 plus 4 or 3. The other endpoint is positive 1 so I'll do the same thing to establish the height of the other endpoint. f of 1 would be 2 times 1 cubed plus 1 squared minus 8 times 1 minus 4. This will leave me with 2 plus 1 minus 8 minus 4. This will be 3 minus 12, or negative 9. Now, what does it mean for a function to have a root? A root is synonymous with it, a 0 or an x-intercept. So I want you to think for a moment, if we apply the intermediate value theorem to this question, what do you think the k value would be if we're talking about an x-intercept or a root? What would the height have to be if we're talking about this situation. Well, we're talking about a k value of 0. So I'm going to draw a little sketch here to illustrate what we have so far. When we plugged in negative 1, we got an output of 3. When we plugged in 1, we got an output of negative 9. We established right from the start that this function was continuous, 
which means that I have to draw it without lifting up my pencil. So I've got to connect this point with that point and I can't pick up my pencil. The question is, does this force us to have a root or an x-intercept between negative one and one? The answer is yes. And that's because the k value zero is between that height of three and that height of negative nine. So our conclusion is f of x must have at least one zero. Could it have had more zeros? Yes, the graph might have looked like this. We don't know what the graph looks like and that's not what the question is asking. It just says, must there be a root, a root? And we said that there must be at least one. There could be more, but at least one.